Gerald Bosch, and welcome to World Wednesday. This is a uh, ongoing series of presentations that I've been doing for several years now, um, looking at significant current events, uh, global events. So I've got a couple of things I want to talk about. And if you have questions, please uh, you know, feel free to ask or post something in chat or whatever. Um, For the last year, I've been starting this off with uh, um, some discussion of what's going on with the pandemic, because it's arguably the biggest thing uh, happening in the world. And uh, luckily, the, uh, the BBC is nice enough to create <clears throat> a... a snapshot on a regular basis of where things are with the total numbers and all of this. And you can see them here. Um, unfortunately, unlike last month when I was doing this, where the 56 day trends were downward in terms of both deaths and new cases, they are now going back up. There are a couple of things at work here um, one is there's, you know, been a spike during the spring, especially here in the United States, uh, that seems to be leveling off at this point, but the bigger sort of dangerous trend areas are in India where things had been going down. There's a massive ongoing, uh, immunization effort there, but there has been a dramatic uptick and in Europe where we've also been seeing for a couple of months now, uh, newer, higher numbers, particularly associated with these, uh, these new variants. So, um, unfortunately, this story is hard, is far from over. And there's a lot of ground to be covered before uh, we can really start looking at uh, um, the end of this story. Does anybody have any questions, anything um, about this? See some more people have entered. Welcome. All right, well, there we go. I decided to put in a bit of a change in how I've done these in the past and start with some ongoing events that uh, things have changed with and a couple of things I talked about last month and one that's been a story longer than I've been doing this, and that is Afghanistan, uh, because the Biden administration made a major announcement about um, the ongoing U.S. military presence in Afghanistan yesterday. Now, for the background, Operation Enduring Freedom, the, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, began October 7th. 2011. In the ensuing time, estimates put the total number of people killed at 157,000. Well over half of those people are um, or were civilians. Um, this does not include the vastly larger number of people that 
were injured or have been displaced or whatever. Uh, out of this, about 2,300 U.S. service personnel have been killed in this just about 20 year, uh, 19 and a half year period of the uh, U.S. intervention in Afghanistan. Um, there was an existing plan for a U.S. withdrawal by May 1st, but this was based on a fairly vague set of conditions, and even those conditions were not entirely met. This was something laid out by the uh, uh, by the, the Trump administration. Well, the Biden administration has announced, I think it was yesterday, that they are planning for a complete troop withdrawal by September 11th of this year. And in a break with not just the Trump administration, but the, um, uh, the initial negotiations under the Obama administration, this is not tied to any conditions on the ground. So this is not presupposing any kind of political settlement, cessation to the fighting, anything of that nature. Basically, the announcement is the U.S. is pulling out. And it is generally expected, although the, you know, this has not been fully confirmed, that the remaining NATO forces are going to be pulling out at the same time, that uh, none of the NATO countries that have continued to be involved in, a, in the operations in Afghanistan are going to be maintaining um, uh, notable troop presences there. Now, there will almost certainly be ongoing training, advising, things like that, these sort of operations that uh, the U.S. is engaged in in, in other places in the Middle East, in Africa, um, no doubt that kind of thing is going to continue. But as far as deployed troops in a combat role, the announcement is this will be over on September 11th. And kind of the big shocker is the idea of this being a uh, be, this being done totally without um, conditions. The response from uh, particularly various factions in Afghanistan has been decidedly mixed. Um, the conditions there are not good. The Taliban has been resurging, um, not so much in kind of main combat actions, seizing territory, but in targeted killings of assassinations of, of intellectuals, of social activists, of people who are saying anything that they don't really like. And so, you know, the Biden administration has announced that the United States will continue to be using everything in its power to positively affect the outcome in Afghanistan, but basically the only thing that the U.S. had to affect the situation in Afghanistan was its military presence. Um, the flip side, of course, is that the Biden administration, and I believe President Biden said this directly, um, we've been trying conditions on a withdrawal plan for 20 years and none of them have worked. Um, and sort of some of the word from the administration, from inside the administration, is that, in essence, this is real politique. It is, there's not a perceived current terrorist threat against the United States emanating from Afghanistan. So the idea of an ongoing American military presence there is not necessary for American security whatever the result's going to be for the people in Afghanistan. That's the message that's coming out. And there is a solid argument, and I'm kind of 
veering off into my own thing that there's not going to be a political settlement of this as long as there are US troops in Afghanistan. Um, the negotiations will just never happen. But there's, all, there's just too many incentives for the Taliban to continue fighting as long as there are US troops, because then they could point and say, we're fighting against foreign infidel invaders, which actually ties into some I'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, so this is the news. I mean, what the response is going to be, I don't think the Taliban has officially said anything. Um, the Taliban leadership is not entirely unified in any case. But the expectation by a lot of people is that the Taliban is going to be immensely strengthened by this and whether the Afghan government is going to be able to maintain itself in the face of that is, uh, you know, it's a big question that nobody's got an answer for. Questions or comments or anything about this big announcement in Afghanistan? I just, I just hope what happened, what happened in Iraq. Was... <laughs> Sorry, I did not hear you. I did not have oh, my okay. speaker on. <laughs> I was saying, I'm just, I'm just hoping what happened in Iraq doesn't happen in Afghanistan, like the first time we tried to pull out of Iraq. Um, I mean, the idea of a resurgent insurgency, it seems very likely. Um. Again, because the, the Taliban is, I mean, to a much greater extent than what became ISIS on the ground in Afghanistan, the Taliban is an operational, functional government and military entity that holds territory. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, there's no way this does not have a negative impact on a lot of people in Afghanistan. Um, it's a it just will. Anybody else? Any questions or comments or anything? Okay. Uh, Last month, I spent some time talking about the coup in Myanmar and the month before that. Well, this is an on, another ongoing story. Um, uh, again, if you're unaware of this, on February 1st, uh, the military, which had governed Myanmar for decades and had in recent years allowed a civilian government limited power. Um, this sometimes gets described as move towards democracy, but the army continued to control large portions of the legislature, was setting the stage and setting the terms and as far as how the constitution was going to work. So the army continued to hold a lot of political power even before this. But elections back in November went very much in favor of the existing uh, major party, the NDP, and the army and the party that they were backing in the civilian elections cried election fraud. And based on this, the army overthrew the, uh, the government, arrested Aung San Suu Kyi, the, uh, uh, the prime minister, and uh, uh, announced a one-year state of emergency. The head of the armed forces, who has been the head of the armed forces for a long period of time, has talked about the creation of a more disciplined democracy for Myanmar. Um, and at the end of this has promised free and fair elections. There have been ongoing protests in favor of a return to civilian government. Um, 
at least 700 people have been killed um, uh, by the security forces. Um, these are documented deaths. There could be more. At least 40 of these were children. Um, for example, a 14-year-old girl opening the door of her house to people fleeing um, uh, some of the security people after a uh, uh, after or in the midst of one of the protests was shot dead um, inside her house. This has been kind of an ongoing thing. Um, these are the largest protests since what's called the Saffron Rebellion that led to the pro-democracy movement when thousands of Buddhist monks took to the streets in Myanmar against the, uh, uh, the, the military government that had been in place since the 1960s. The civilian, the heads of the civilian government, particularly Aung San Suu Kyi, they remain imprisoned she was initially charged by the military with illegal importation of devices. She has now been charged with violations of the Official Secrets Act. The exact nature of what these charges are about remains very uncertain. And she's not just in prison, she is incommunicado. Nobody is exactly sure where she is, and she is not being allowed, nor any of the other leaders of the civilian government, to speak to anybody um, who aren't their jailers. The coup has drawn widespread international condemnation, um, economic sanctions against the military leaders who are heavily invested in numerous businesses. The, the guy who's the head of the army is one of the richest guys in Myanmar, used his position in the army in order to take control of various businesses for his family. This is a general thing with the, uh, the, the commanders of the Myanmar military. Um, a move to condemn this and impose things through the UN Security Council was blocked by China which is Myanmar's largest ally. Um, however, China has called for a return to civilian government for Aung San Suu Kyi to be, uh, and the other civilian leaders to be released, which is a big move on the part of China. Um, their general thing has always been to condemn any attempts to intervene in the internal affairs of Myanmar, that they are joining international calls for a return to the situation before the coup and for Aung San Suu Kyi to be, uh, uh, to be released is a sign that Beijing is not happy with this situation. Questions? Anything about the coup in Myanmar? Comments or anything? Okay, uh, another thing I was talking about in March. Oh, excuse me is the situation in Mozambique in uh, uh, south, uh, the southeastern coast of Africa. In, um, or over the last year, there have been several major attacks in one of the poorest provinces in Mozambique, not a wealthy country to begin with, uh, called Cabo Delgado. Um, this is home to fairly recently discovered major petroleum and natural gas reserves that several European countries and the United States have been involved in 
setting up infrastructure and um, uh, building a facility. French firm has been uh, heavily involved in constructing a major natural gas um, uh, a facility in Cabo Delgado. Um, there has been a growing insurgency in the area by a group referred to as Al-Shabaab. You may have heard this term elsewhere. This is not the same Al-Shabaab that is operating elsewhere in Africa. Al-Shabaab is an Arabic word meaning youth. Um, this Al-Shabaab, the, the more famous Al-Shabaab is aligned with Al-Qaeda. This Al-Shabaab has publicly announced its alignment with the Islamic State. It's very unclear how organized this group is. There has been violence going on in the region since 2017. Um, attacks, killings, beheadings, um, various terrorist attacks. This is spilled over the border into Tanzania. Uh, it has posted, it has uh, prompted military responses by Mozambican forces, uh, uh, also by the Tanzanian military. Shortly after our last World Wednesday, there was an attack on the city of Palma um, that killed dozens of people. Uh, the, uh, the insurgents overran the city. Um, the total number of casualties is actually rather unclear. Uh, again, Mozambique security forces have locked down this area for months, have allowed very limited visits by any outside agencies, not just press, but humanitarian groups, um, you know, international observers of any sort whatsoever. They have brought in a mercenary unit from South Africa, which being used in, in a counterinsurgency uh, uh, counterinsurgency role. Estimates by the UN and other groups, uh, uh, non-governmental groups on the ground, that 700,000 people have been displaced from this area, some of them moving over the border into Mozambique, into Tanzania, other in, others into surrounding regions in Mozambique. Amnesty International has documented instances of torture, extrajudicial killings by both the government forces and the rebel forces in the region. This week, the World Food Program uh, called for donations to an emergency fund. They're estimating that 950,000 people in the region, so just shy of a million, are in imminent danger of starvation. There's a lot of questions about what's going on here. The narrative from the Mozambique government is that this is an instance of foreign insurgents, Muslim insurgents, politicizing a conflict, creating an insurgency inside the country, that this is entirely foreign driven. A lot of people who have been watching the situation in Mozambique for a long time think that while there is definitely a foreign role in all of this, that a lot of this is actually civil unrest. Again, Cabo Delgado is a very poor area in an already poor country. Over the last decade, first ruby mines were discovered in the area and then significant petroleum and natural gas reserves. The government in Mozambique contracted with the United with firms from the United States and uh, 
from Europe to build facilities. Those companies built facilities there and primarily brought in foreign workers in order to do it. Uh, according to one estimate, about four times as many jobs were generated for people in the United States by this as for people in Mozambique. And of the Mozambicans who have been employed there, almost none of them actually come from Cabo Delgado. They are from other areas in the country that are more closely aligned with the, uh, with the government. You kind of note on the map there, Maputo is the capital. It is at the farthest southern extreme of the country, Cabo Delgado, of course, up in the north. So you've got a lot of unhappy poor people who are seeing growing prosperity literally in front of them, and they are actively denied any ability to get jobs, to take part in this. That's a lot of anger. Add to this, this region is, has a long history of involvement with narco trafficking within Southern Africa. It's not kind of an international thing so much, but um, in this area. So you've got drug gangs on the ground. Poverty, anger, armed criminal gangs, throw in a bunch of foreign money, quite possibly some radical forces from outside telling angry local people, this is the result of foreign infidels, and you've got this mess. Um, again, there's a lot of questions about the leadership. Very recently, the U.S. added this group to its sort of international terrorist list. Uh, the United States does not refer to this as al-Shabaab. They call it um, uh Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant in Mozambique, because there have been videos from this group pledging their loyalty to uh, the, the cause of the Islamic State. How much actual like material is flowing in, what the actual connections are beyond you know, videos in the radical uh, Islamist sphere on the internet is a matter of debate and question, nobody really knows. Mozambique has been very reluctant to allow any sort of international intervention of any type in this situation. Um, they have recently agreed to extremely limited military support missions by the United States. Uh, basically, some special forces guys from Africa Command were sent in to do counterinsurgency training with the with elements of the Mozambican military. A slightly larger deal with Portugal, which is kind of a thing because Portugal used to be the colonial country here and was driven out after a long civil war in the 1970s. Um, but this has been very limited. They've been very hesitant. They also are basically locking out most NGOs, humanitarian organizations. They don't want any of these people on the ground. And again, the reasoning for this might get back to some of the uh, Amnesty International reports or what they're finding, which is that the government is being about as brutal as the Al-Shabaab uh, insurgents in their treatment of the locals. And for those who are talking about the possibility of any sort of larger military intervention, and it gets back to the Afghanistan thing, once there are foreign troops of any sort on the ground, suddenly you've got a propaganda battle where the insurgents can say, well, what we are engaged in is a fight against foreign infidel invaders who are coming into our country 
And so we call on the entire Islamic world to join us in jihad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's some real question about you know, if there's gonna be an international military response, which would more likely come from the, not from the African Union so much as the Southern African developed nations, South Africa, possibly Zimbabwe, Zambia, um, Tanzania. Um, you know, how extensive that could be? Is it gonna create a bigger problem? There's no clear answers. And so all this is being debated literally right now. And this situation could flare up, become much worse. I mean, it's already crossing the border into Tanzania. This could become like Somalia, another major hotspot. Um, this is another situation that's developing. Questions or comments or anything about Mozambique? Just to confirm, for now it is confined to the Cabo Delgado region. Yeah. Okay. Because you know there have been there have been like limited attacks in the surrounding areas, but uh, the 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 real fighting is all going on there, and it's really centered around that natural gas facility that the French are building. Yeah, we're hoping to run a study abroad program in Zimbabwe next year. So they keep it to that corner. I would appreciate it. Um, uh, yeah, as far as I know, nothing's spilling, you know, that yeah, far right. down the country. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you know, there's been some stuff over the border into Tanzania, but most of Tanzania hasn't been affected. Um, yeah. The big questions for the surrounding country at the moment are, um, you know, 700,000 displaced people. And so, um, uh, you know, many of them are sort of pouring across international boundaries into Burundi and uh, uh, Tanzania. Yeah. So. Then, oh. Iran. A Natanz nuclear facility. Um, I very likely have never heard of this place until the last few days. Uh, over the weekend, um, Natanz on Sunday. Um, Natanz is a site for enriching uranium. In Iran, you can kind of see it on the map there where all this is. Uh, it's sort of in the center of the country, south of Tehran. Uh, it's underground, it's like 50 meters underground. It's the, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, it's the only site that under the 2015 nuclear agreement where Iran was allowed to maintain centrifuges and continue to enrich rain. So um, this, this is the site for that um, uh, in Iran. On Sunday, there were reports of an explosion and a blackout. Um, yesterday, more information about the extent of the damage came out. Uh, first, it was said that some centrifuges were damaged. Uh, an official from the Iranian nuclear agency says that many of the of these centrifuges were damaged. Um, little background, enriching uranium for various uses involves the use of centrifuges to, um, uh, uh, to get them to a level of purity. Um, Some more advanced centrifuges that Iran had purchased were brought into operation on Saturday. And then on Sunday, the explosion. Israel has not openly said that they did this, but basically everybody knows that Israel did this. In Israel, 
Israeli public radio is talking about how Israel did this. Um, Iran has blamed Israel. The United States is talking about this as if it's just a fact. And Israel, while not acknowledging that they did it, are not denying that they did it. And certainly it would be in line with Israeli policy. Um, because of the security on the site and all of this, and because again of proven capabilities of other attacks, it's assumed that this was a cyber attack by the Israelis that in some fashion interfered with the cooling systems inside this bunker led to the explosion and the damage to the, uh, the centrifuges. Yesterday, the Iranian government vowed retaliation. Uh, today, they announced at least one part of this, um, that they are going to enrich uranium up to a level of 20% of 60% purity. They had only ever enriched up to 20% purity up until this point. And that as part of this, they're going to install and activate newer generation centrifuges that they had purchased but had not been using as part of the whole negotiation because the whole thing about this nuclear agreement is about enrichment um, or a lot of it's about enrichment and so elements of it have been about what centrifuges can you have and what centrifuges can you use and can you use these model sixes when you have been using these model ones and so this has all been part of the negotiations um, and they announced that in response to this they're going to power up the new ones and they are going to increase the level of purity of these to 60 percent. Um, now for the background of all of this a little bit about the 2015 nuclear agreement that's sort of the big diplomatic thing that's surrounding this. Uh, the You'll sometimes hear this referred to as the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This is the agreement that was made in 2015 that the United States, the European Union, Iran, Israel, all signed on to. Under this, again, Natanz, the only site that uh, uh, uranium enrichment is supposed to be going on at in Iran. They had had another site that was closed down. They're only supposed to be enriching uranium to 3.67% purity, which is what you use for medical purposes, basically. Um, just put in as a note there, to get to so-called weapons grade, means enriching to 90% purity. That's what you need to have in order to not have a dirty bomb because that's just exploding radioactive stuff around, but um, uh, to, to have an actual functional nuclear weapon. As part of the agreement, other nuclear sites were shut down or retasked to other purposes. Um, not just enrichment sites, but this was also agreements about the production of, of deuterium, uh, heavy water, things like that. So there were a lot of different elements, a lot of moving parts to this thing. And the Iranians had agreed in 2015 to international monitoring of all of this stuff, of what you know centrifuges they're buying and what materials they buy that could be used for these sorts of purposes and then where they're putting them and on-site inspections at Natanz and all of the others. Uh, there was a whole set of agreements on this. In return, an existing set of sanctions by Europe and the United States were going to be lifted. In 2017, the Trump administration withdrew the United States from the JCPOA and instituted economic sanctions. Iran responded to this by basically cranking up the centrifuges. Um, 
they increased enrichment kind of step by step. It was sort of an ongoing escalation up to 20%. And they built a, they have built now a larger stockpile of nuclear material than they have ever had. Because they began violating the terms of the agreement by enriching more stuff and enriching more material and to a higher level than is allowed under the JCPOA, uh, the EU, uh, the, uh, the European Union instituted sanctions in line with the JCPOA. The Biden administration wants to resume, has announced they want to resume negotiations and basically go back to the JCPOA as a starting point. But the position of the Biden administration is that the first step in this is Iran has to stop enriching, open up for inspections, go back to their agreement. Iran says, no, the sanctions were dropped unilaterally and we were not violating this in 2017. So the first thing that has to happen is the sanctions have to stop. Then we will return to the JCPOA guidelines and we can begin from there. There are ongoing discussions, but this is kind of, this is the impasse that things have been in for a few weeks now. The Netanyahu government in Israel does not want this return to the 2015 agreement at all. And a wide variety of international voices and observers um, see this attack on Natanz as a, aimed at Iran's nuclear capability, but also basically trying to shoot the negotiations over the impasse in the foot, trying to stop them from happening so that this whole process needs, from their position, to be torn down to the ground and completely rebuilt. In essence, the position of the Israeli government is that no, nuclear material whatsoever should be being produced inside Iran. And of course, the Iranian position is that Israel should not exist because it's an illegal state. So this is what's going on at the moment. Iran is kind of playing their card, which is continuing to up the level of violations of the JCPOA to both punish Israel and put pressure on the United States and the EU to drop the sanctions while at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this falls into the middle of this. Worth seeing this also in a wider context of what is often called the shadow war between Iran and Israel. The Iranians and the Israelis don't just throw harsh language at each other. They have been in a basically undeclared state of war for years. A lot of this has been going on on the ground in Syria, but has kind of been lost in the wider civil conflict going on there. But the Iranians are backing militias in Syria. These Iranian-backed militias attack into Lebanon, um, are supporting you know, various actions threatening the Israelis. The Israelis, in turn, have been undertaking airstrikes and uh, military attacks at targets in southern Syria. So we're like one step short of an actual shooting war in this area, sort of proxy thing. The Israelis have undertaken cyber attacks at the 
particularly the Iranian nuclear program before, successful ones. Again, they never have admitted this, but it's one of those, it's kind of like the Israeli possession of a nuclear weapon. They've never owned up to them having nuclear weapons, but everybody knows they've got them. Same deal here. A lot of Iranian nuclear scientists have died under very suspicious circumstances over the last few years. And again, the general assumption is that most, if not all of this, is due to Mossad. So another front in all of this. There's also this ongoing thing where Iranian and Israeli ships keep suddenly exploding, um, holes get ripped in the side of the hull of a, an Israeli ship in the Mediterranean, and nobody's 100% sure how that hole could have gotten there. And then two weeks later, an Iranian ship mysteriously has a boiler explosion. So there also seems to be some sort of covert maritime sabotage program going on, very tit for tat between the two. So this is kind of a ramp up of the shadow war. Uh, that's another one of the many ongoing conflicts in the Levant region. Okay, questions, comments, uh, anything about this stuff? Okay, um, that's all I've got for today, so. Well, I wanted to say one thing. I wanted to congratulate Charles. This is his last passport event he had to attend, and now he is 100% completely a global scholar. Yay. Congratulations. Charles. And I think Jessica was here too. She still has. Congratulations. <laughs> Yay, Charles. And thank you, Gerald. Thank you. So wait, I did, I did, I did think of a question. This isn't the first time that they've had a cyber attack happen in one of their centrifuge facilities, is it? No, the uh, the Israelis pulled off one. I can't remember. I, I think it was um, uh, might have just been last year, but right. uh, but there they, was one yeah, way the, earlier too. Run there. I mean, this is like the fourth or fifth that's happened to them, where their facilities, their centrifuge facilities, have like caught fire. And, 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 and I think it's funny, though, because, I mean, yeah, it may be a cyber attack from Israel, or, I mean, it, do they have the same people working in the same facilities? You know what I mean? Could it be the same guy making the same mistake in each one, and they, then they're just like, it's Israel? <laughs> well, I mean, somebody might, I hate, who knows, but it's notable that the Israelis never deny this stuff. And... Before this sort of cyber capacity was really there, when you know pre-internet age, the Israeli response to earlier early moves by the Iranians to build nuclear weapons was flat-out airstrikes. Um, so that they would be doing this in a covert way seems to make a lot of sense. But yeah, it's you know always possible that somebody could have an accident in the middle of you know. A very real conflict that could make things that much worse, right? Is nobody's going to believe it's an accident right now. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. And congratulations. And, uh, we'll be back again in the fall. Yay. Thanks, Gerald. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye, Miss Susan. Bye.